couple of experiences I had when I was a junior faculty member, and I was flipping out about how to, you know, uh, be successful in work and, you know, be, be a good father and partner. And, you know, that um, I got this call from Dr. Fishman, the former chairman of neurology, his secretary, D. And Dee called up, and uh, I was in my office, and she said, hey, Dan, you know, Dr. Fishman was uh, wondering whether you'd be willing to uh, join him and a couple other faculty for a dinner for a visiting professor next Wednesday. And as soon as she got that far, I'm saying to myself, God damn it, you know, I don't want to do this. I know I won't, don't want to do this. I don't want to go out. You know, and it's the, it's the chairman calling. And she continued, she said, you know, it's going to be between seven and, nine, and 7 and 9, and, you know, it's going to be delightful at a nice place. And I'm saying to myself, nope, this is not going to work because I want to be home tucked in, tucking our children. I think, yeah, Stefan had just been born. Um, and it, so it's just, you know, there was this conflict, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so finally, as she, she said, so what do you think? And I said, there was, I said, you know, well, deep to tell you the truth. You know, Stefan was, you, you know, we had our second child just a couple of months ago, and you know what? It's just, it's just really important to me. Um, it's, it's just really important to me that I'm home, you know, and to tuck in the kids. And there was this pause. You know? <laughs> and my image was my MD with wings flying away. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, that is so nice. That is so nice. You know what? I can find somebody else. Don't 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 worry. Click. She never called me again. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was it. And uh, the the second experience, and again, we have all had this in different ways. You get a call. You know, hey Dan, this is Frances, uh, uh, president of the American Epilepsy Society. I, I, you know, she's a friend of mine, so I know that that's what. Hey, listen, you know the the committee for the symposium, the presidential symposium, just met last week and we put together the program and we would like for you to be the keynote speaker. There's no question you're the person we would love to have. And you're and I'm thinking to myself, no, it's not gonna work. It's family vacation, you know, I am not gonna do it. So so you, you you say, you know, thanks so much. I really appreciate it, but you know we're we're on vacation that week. I can't do it. And then you hang up and actually what happens is Francis says, all right, Dan can't do it. Who is, who's next on the list? You know, I'm like number five on the list. Right? <laughs> so so you're just we're just not as important as people who may make us out to be. All right, keep that in mind. All right, um, near, near the end here. Uh, be prepared for the in inevitable storm. So another picture um, from Corbet, um, the stormy sea. Um, uh, you've you've experienced far enough life um, to realize that it's not um, it's not the fairy tale that we were raised to think it is. Um, I'm touching on a bit of a theme that I talked in the last lecture. For those of you who heard the last lecture, if you haven't, you can see it on YouTube if you want. Um, um, I, I, I talked about the fact that. Um, in the health professions, we're given kind of an extraordinary early look at the reality of, of, of life, and that is that the world is filled with suffering. Um, that's just the reality. Um, and the fairy tales that we have constructed for us, that we construct for our children, um, if we have the fortune of being able to deliver fairy tales to our children, are there to, to try to protect <coughs> us, I think, from that reality so that we can have some sense of hope as we're growing up. But um, you, you have to be blind to not see that the world is filled with suffering. And um, to take it a step further, I haven't encountered anyone, virtually anyone, who doesn't have a cross to bear in life. So um, I think that the storms are inevitable. Um, and um, my suggestion is, that you deepen your spiritual anchors. Um, a lot of people have, have shared with me that they feel as though their sense of spiritual connectedness um, has been either lost or put on hold or they're treading water because of the hard work that we do. Um, and I think that that's common. I mean, we just work so darn hard. You get pulled into so much of sort of trying to do what the, you know, the next step in front of you. I'd be really cautious um, about um, 
staying in that state for too long. Um, in fact, I'd, e I'd even say if you can, if you can um, believe this, um, this piece of advice, I, I would take a close look at you know, your spiritual connections and take care of them. Um, uh, this happens to be a, um, a book from an author that Milo and I really have, are, have been drawn to, Eknath Eswan, is just a, it's a, was a, he, he died about 10 or 15 years ago, was a, uh, really a genius in, in terms of his ability to understand the, the messages of many, of all the, of the great world religions and synthesize them in a way that focuses in on aspects of of living that I think have a lot of merit. And meditation is one practice that um, I believe has a tremendous amount of value. Um, other things like um, um, one-pointed attention and training the senses and um, putting others first and so forth are, 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 again, themes that come out of all religions. Um, uh, a number of you know that uh, uh, we lost one of our children a couple of years ago uh, in, in a terrible accident. And um, we have, uh, we, I speak for myself, but I know I'm speaking for Milo as well, you know, I've taken, taken a, placed a lot of attention on my spiritual connectedness. Um, it is never, was never tested more than when we lost our child. Uh, and I can tell you that going through that experience, the, the, the anchors held strong. They really did. And I'm, I'm really thankful for that. I'm thankful for the fact that the other other people in my family have also had that connectedness because you can imagine what it's like if if any one member is completely uprooted or or um, cast into the storm, how difficult that can make. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, so um, I, I, I think I can sense that you guys see what I'm talking about. Um, it's around it's in it's around us to see every every day that we're you know taking care of patients. It's right there. The, the, the only difference between our patients and ourselves is our current good fortune. So, okay. So I think I think this is the last one. <laughs> so yeah, this is the eighth one. So uh, feel nervous when you're not leaping from boundaries. Okay, that kind of it kind of connects to the creativity thing. Um, the work that we do, the, the opportunities that we have are actually it's unbelievable to think about the range of opportunities that we have in the professions that we're pursuing. It's amazing, you know, that we can choose between, in medicine, for example, um, uh, signing up and being a physician in a really, really good community-based practice, where you know, you know, you know, you're going to be able to take care of patients every day. You know, you're going to have a job. And you know, you're going to make a, a, a good, a good salary, take care of uh, your family, and so forth. Or in the other range. You know, actually wake up every day and not really know exactly what you're going to do that day, or have decided, you know, created your own day each day, which is, I think, true of a lot of academia. It's amazing to have that. Um, um, if things are just too comfortable, then you might feel a little bit nervous about it. Okay, um, I think back to the the deal with society and creativity. Um, we're expected to be leaping from boundaries. Um, uh, enjoy the fall when you do. Okay, um, it's it's uh, if you if you're dancing along those boundaries, um, you, you're going to fall, and that's okay. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with falling. We're all falling um, in the big picture. Um, it's just what it is. Okay, so um, uh, just to conclude, uh, those of you who may have figured out the all these images have come from Musée d'Orsay in Paris. If you haven't been to that museum, put it on your bucket list. It's an incredible museum. Um, I'm biased. I haven't played what's there. Um, but I just wanted to tell you two quick stories that are related to it uh, and maybe tie into all this. And that is um, the, the, the impact that creativity actually has. Sometimes it's hard to see when we're just, just down, in the, down in the muck of what we're doing day to day. And um, this is a picture from Manet uh, called The Picnic in the Grass. It's one of the first, it's a big picture, it's a big painting. It's one of the first in the chronological set of the um, Impressionist paintings that are in Musée um, d'Orsay. And uh, not, it's not my favorite by, by any stretch of the Impressionist. I happen to like Impressionist uh, art. And by the way, I know virtually nothing about it. It's just I happen to like it. 
Um, but the reason I uh, highlight this is I didn't realize this until my first visit to the museum, is that Manet is considered to be the, you know, one of the fathers of Impressionism. And this was one of the first paintings that um, was observed and, and became notorious because of the content and the technique. And I won't go into the details, but um, this was, a, a, according to the, uh, 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 the, the Parisian uh, uh, artists of the time, this was totally outrageous. I mean, you just didn't paint like this. Apparently, you don't put nudes who are known to society. This is so one of the, it may have been Manet's or one of these guys' uh, uh, girlfriends or wives or something. You don't, you don't put someone just nude in the center of a painting looking at the observer. Um, uh, you don't have this kind of levitation. You know, this, this woman is not really in proper perspective. Uh, and you don't have the, what is, was the beginning of the artist's impression of this picnic in the grass. I mean, before then, realism was meant to capture, like photography, to capture either the real world or capture the imagined world of the heavens. And this was the departure of that. So um, this, the claim to fame, of course, for Manet is that this, this was uh, put in the Exposition Refusée, the, refuse, the refusal exposition, which was placed outside of the, you know, what, what, uh, what you expected. And this was the beginning of, of a, a new era of art. What amazes me about this is the date, 1863. Uh, Impressionist art was took over by the 1880s. That's just like 20 years. So in 20 years, the, the, the world of, of art, of painted art, went through a revolution. And I, it just blows me away. Because, for again, for the more senior people in the room, I won't look at you here, but the three of them, you know, you know, 20 years just doesn't seem like that much anymore. You know? And so it's just really encouraging to me that, that the world can go through so much change in, in a period of a couple of decades. And just a, uh, one more example, this one's so obvious, but I, I just think it's so amazing. And that is the, the we are living through this awesome revolution. Um, see, someone's looking at our iPhone right now. You're making a point. Thank you. That's all right. That's all right, that's all right because that's what I want. That's the next part of the uh, in, um, Honestly, you know, uh, in, in my whole lifetime, my whole lifetime, and I, I was I was born when 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 the report on DNA came out in Nature. Um, I can't think of anything that I've observed that has been more of a revolution in human behavior than the, the cyclone. Um, to, to the difference between walking down the street now and before ten years ago. Actually, when did the iPhone come out? 2001, so 2007, six or seven, 2007, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, maybe 2006, but I think it's 2007, six years ago, they didn't exist before then. I still don't have one. Okay, all right, but, but to, you know, to walk down the street and see the way humans are behaving now, connected to this thing, is, is absolutely extraordinary. Um, so you guys are, you know, you're in the midst of this, this true, this true revolution, and um, I think the, the 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 possibilities for applying creativity and teams of people working together in a whole new way are are really <laughs> extraordinary. And it, have any of you read this book, The Swerve? I'm going to finish on this. Any of you heard about this book? Okay, highly recommend. You have, have you? Yeah. Okay, highly recommended. Um, God knows when you'll find time to read, but but if you can make some time to read this book, it's it's definitely one of the best books I've ever read. Um, uh, Greenblatt. It's a book about a an Italian um, a papal secretary who was obsessed with trying to uh, find and restore the the ancient writings. Of the, of the Romans and the Greeks. Um, uh, 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 as you may know, um, you know, books were handwritten, and, and actually the parchment, the paper that they were written on was, was very um, fragile. And so there were you know, untold numbers of books from, say, Greek times that, that were lost to um, uh, fire and floods and mildew. And there were even wealthy um, 
wealthy uh, statesmen who would buy, buy up the old, good quality uh, Greek writings and uh, buy them not for the writings but for the parchment. So they would actually have their, their, their secretaries essentially white out the, the writings of the, of the Greek philosophers so that they could, they could write their own stories. True. So anyway, this, this is about this papal secretary and his discovery of, of a, Greek, a, a, a Greek writing. Um, but the amazing thing about this is to learn about what the world was like before the invention of the, of the, of the um, printing press by Gutenberg. And I think that the revolution that we're going through right now in the, you know, this first part of the 21st century is equivalent to what happened in, I think it was in 1520 or so, 1530, on the printing press. I don't think there's been as big a change in terms of the way people communicate in those 500 years. So there you go. Those are the eight aphorisms and some 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 suggestions about how to find some balance. Any any other any other thoughts or questions? Okay, we'll write to me if you like. <laughs>